Welcome to today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light. Sun, Salt, and Light, S-O-N, knowing and growing in your daily relationship with Jesus Christ, but also being the salt and the light in your marriage, in your family, at your place of work, at your church, and even in the community you're in. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. This is a radio ministry of our church, Calvary Chapel Divine, here in Divine, Texas. We are so glad that you joined us for today's broadcast. We are a Calvary Chapel, so we simply teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We believe that God uses His Word to transform, restore, and to change lives one verse at a time. If you're visiting our area, you'd like to get information about our church or church service times, maybe even track down some of the other teachings that we have available through podcasts, whether it's through Audible or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can do all of that at our church website at calvarydivine.org. That's calvarydivine.org. Amen. So we'll look at this in three parts. Actually, in in the first part of verse 3, we'll look at being born again. And then in the second part of verse 3, The second half of it, being born into a living hope. And then in verses 4 and 5, born again and protected by the power of God. I love that term, the power of God. That was the thing that just stood out to me this week as I was studying this. We forget that. That's why Peter is always trying to remind you that you're coming from a place of victory. The battle's... The the war is over. These are just skirmishes that are happening now. And we forget that. And and so last week we simply uh, saw the beauty of the Scripture as as Peter shared with us in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So we learned last week that you were selected by the Father. You were elected. And that you were chosen by the foreknowledge of God. And many men have tried to, with their finite minds, tried to understand this. And wrap their heads around this. And write major theology papers on this. Who knows who's elected? God. I don't. I have a command that I am supposed to do what? Share the gospel make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What happens with a lot of people, and this is the only issue I have really with people that are Reformed, there is a sect of people that are Reformed that believe that they're already elected or not elected, so I'm not supposed to share the gospel. And they miss the command. If we look at John 3.16, it was the whosoever's, right? And so we're supposed to share the gospel with everybody. And that's why, again, that's why I was telling you, Calvary Chapel takes a very balanced approach of that. We're not leaning on Arminianism and we're not leaning on Calvinism. We take a balanced approach of it. We believe that that, that's God's infinite wisdom. He knows who's elect and who's not elect. Our job is to share the gospel. We need to remember that. And then we see that as that Selection is done and, and people come to faith. They are sanctified by the Spirit. That's when the work of the Spirit is done. Sanctification. You're set apart and you're made in the image of Christ. Every day, God is working on your life so you grow to be more like, not you, His Son, Jesus. That's the work of the Spirit. We have to remember that. If you're not growing... You're in trouble. You're drifting. You have to, it is important for you to understand growth. uh, You have to be teachable. You have to be willing to grow. And it is the work of the Spirit that sets us apart to be more like Christ, to be made in the image of Christ. And, And growth is a major part of that. It's the work of the Spirit. And then we see that we were saved by the Son. The sovereign source of our salvation. And I love that he said to obey Jesus, be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. It's like you're supposed to do what? Obey Christ. 
Obey Christ. And as you're, you become a follower of God, you are sprinkled and covered by the blood of God. Meaning that when God sees you, He sees His Son. If you're a child of God, you're covered by His blood. So your past, your present, your future sins, which is justification, you're forgiven. But He wants you to live in obedience to Him now. He wants you to, to understand as, as you are, are sprinkled with this blood that you should be obedient. And I love that Peter says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. We all need that so badly. So badly. And so we get into our verse here in verse 3. And the first thing we get is blessed be the God. Right now. We would normally just go on and read through that. But do you understand that the word here that's used in the Greek is actually the word for eulogy? And eulogy is not what we think it is today. Eulogy is actually speaking highly of somebody. We eulogize people and they lived a horrible life. You go to, you ever been to a funeral and you go, Who, that, that's not that guy or that's not that woman. I know that woman. All that stuff that man just utilized, you know, used the eulogy, that's not who that person was. But when we, when we speak about God, we come uh, into this understanding that, that your sin has been forgiven and God has given you the privilege, like you have the privilege of actually blessing the Lord. Like giving blessings to God. It tells us in Psalm 103, verse 1, it says, Blessed the Lord, uh, bless, the Lord our, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is, in, uh, that is within me, bless His holy name. In Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. Do you actually give blessings to God? It's almost in a form of adoration. When you pray. And Peter was doing that. Peter was giving blessings to God. And remember, Peter was the one who was rebuked by God on the Mount of Transfiguration. But now he's blessing God. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll see that term used a number of times in the book of uh, First and Second Peter, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a term that, that Peter uses a title of Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Now, the first thing we have to hit before we get into the born again part is we need to talk about His great mercy. Peter just doesn't use the word mercy. He uses great mercy. And the word great actually means infinite. It's an infinite supply of mercy. It's, it, that's the word in the Greek. It means an infinite supply of mercy. And if anybody would have understood Peter, Peter knew about this mercy. Peter was a fisherman. Remember when we looked at the introduction, he, he, he's like, I'm a sinful man. He knew who he was. It's the same Peter that, that receives mercy when he rebukes Christ. And Jesus has to tell him, get behind me, Satan. It's the same Peter that interrupts on the mountain of transfiguration and he's rebuked by God. It's the same Peter that denies Christ three times. It's the same Peter that cuts off Malchus's ear. But it's the mercy, the great mercy that he understood because he was restored by Jesus Christ. See, when Peter writes this, he's writing this from a place of, man, I understand what his mercy is, but I understand it's a great mercy. Because I shouldn't even be walking with God right now. 
See, this is the the thing we have to remember as we talk about an infinite supply of mercy. It's not that that we continue to just keep sinning. Like when you come to faith and you are born again, you understand the cost of the sin. Every time you decide to continue a sin or a habitual sin, you're just putting Christ back up on the cross. It's like you sin less because you understand the cost of the sin. The mercy's there, but it tells us in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may, may increase? Far from it. How, sh- how shall we who died to sin still live in it? It's like we're not supposed to live in it. The way that we have this great mercy and we have the enabling power for us to keep his commandments is because of the Spirit. The great power of God that works through you, through the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when we sin, it should absolutely break your heart. It should. You should know it the moment you've done it. Remember we talked about the the word is a hammer? Right? It's a fire. It's a sword. It'll break it. It lets you know the moment that you've stepped into something that you weren't supposed to step into. It should break your heart. It should cause you to repent. And, and that's, that's where Peter is coming from. He's like, this is the great mercy that we have. It's not so that we sin. It's just this, this is an infinite supply of mercy. So that means that I want to make sure you get this. Because this is hard for us to understand. That means the worst sin that you could ever think of could be forgiven. Think about that. Think about that. The worst sin that was ever committed on Epstein Island could be forgiven by Christ if they repent. We don't think about that. Would we forgive? Oh no, let's let's line them up. <laughs> right? Line them up. Now, I just watched a video. Y'all need to pay attention. I mean, I forget what city it was in, but there was a little kid almost got stolen in broad daylight. Right at the door coming into the, the store. The dad saw it and grabbed the man and saved his child. And the mother was in front of him, and the child was here, and the father was here, and it happened that quick. You need to pay attention to what's going on in your surroundings. You're not dealing with the same world anymore. You're dealing with a very demonic, spiritual warfare of a world where demonic spirits are are just taking people over. You see good and evil being played out. And we are to be merciful. And and one of the things that we know that, that Christ talked about is is as we have been forgiven in, in, uh, of our sins, we are to be merciful. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. We are to be known for our mercy, our forgiving and compassionate spirit. Christians are not known for their mercy. They're ready to go ahead and shoot their wounded. You know what Pastor Chuck used to do? Because let me tell you, there would be guys that would be sent out and they would fall or something would happen. Chuck would bring them back to the church and start ministering to them and discipling them. Where everybody else was like, they're done. Chuck would, Chuck would sit there and be merciful and get them back into the Word and get them back to walking with God. Now, were they able to go back into those positions? No. But he was getting them back to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Christians, uh, unfortunately, we have a, a we shoot the wounded. You did what? Oh, get out! Right? 
And it's like we have to be merciful. That's one of the things. Like Peter talks about this because Peter's coming from a place where he was given that great mercy. And so he's telling you, hey, his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Now, I don't know about you, but to be born again, born again was a term that I used to know when I came to faith in 2009. That's all you heard. Are you born again? And we need to get back to this term. Because if you ask somebody if they know Jesus, they all know Jesus. Are you born again? I want to read to you what the, the term is, and this is not, and I will never, ever give you the Webster Dictionary term. I always go by what the Strong's Concordance is in the Greek or Hebrew. Do not, when you do a study, give the Webster because it's the wrong term. Born again in the Greek means this. This is to be born anew. And this is the most important part here. To have one's mind changed so he lives a new life and one conform to the will of God. Is that person conformed to the will of God? Right? They should become a new creation. Look at John chapter 3. Y'all know the story very well of Nicodemus, but let's look at it. And I think this is why this term needs to come back. Because Jesus uses this term. And Peter does too. He says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from, uh, from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So here's Nicodemus. He's one of the head teachers, the uh, Pharisees. And, and he knows that he, he's heard Jesus teach. He's seen the signs and the wonders that were done. And yet he still is struggling with the belief. He's like, I know you're from God. So he comes at nighttime because he doesn't want anybody to see him so he doesn't lose his position or power. This is not a man who's born again. This is a religious man. And he tells him in verse 3, Jesus responded and said, Truly, truly, and that means uh, just pay attention. Pay attention. It's important. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus said to him, How can a person be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, so he gives it to him again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. He tells them straight up. He's like, you have to be born again. And they go through this, the rest of this teaching. And, and as he, Jesus ends it, he goes, you are the teacher of Israel. And yet you do not understand these things. See, Nicodemus saw it as something that he was supposed to, like, I'm doing everything that God has commanded me to do. I'm a religious leader. I study the, the Torah. I, I know the Torah. I live the Torah. I, I teach in the temple. Well, you're not born again. You're not born again. The question that Nicodemus didn't ask is, how can I be born again? Can I be born again? Because I believe that you are the Messiah. Now that comes later on. Because Nicodemus and, uh, comes to faith. He's there when the, when the body, after the crucifixion. And at that point, the cat's out of the bag and Nicodemus is supporting and following Jesus. But see, this is where we're at today. Is, is when you hear 
the term born again, we, we sometimes will hear something called regeneration. And that's just a, a term they use in theology. But see, having an attitude change, having an external attitude change, like, okay, I'm going to stop drinking because my liver hurts. That's not born again. Showing up to church doesn't make you a Christian. Right? Because here you have somebody like Nicodemus who was involved in religious activity. Who, was, who knew the Word of God. Who went to church. And yet he was not born again. See, to be born again is the supernatural work of God in your life. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, it says, who is, who is the one who overcomes the world? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies. The Spirit is truth. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, But as many as received him to them, he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh. Not the flesh. You can try stuff in the... In the uh, I'm just checking here. I don't know if the batteries are going bad on this thing. You can do all that stuff in, in, your, in your flesh, but that's, it. that's the will of flesh. But he goes on to say, nor of the will of man, but God, but of God. It's not religion. Right? There, there are people that attend that Catholic church that are in religion. And they think they're going to heaven. There may be a handful in there that actually are born again. But they go to church just to go to church. They're born of the will of man. That's what religion does. And anything born of the flesh is from the devil. Just, you know, hello. You have to be born of the will of God. You have to be born of God. And the way that we know that you're born again is you become a new creation in Christ. So through the, the work of God who is supernatural and, and the Holy Spirit comes to work in that person, you now have eternal life. You go from justification into sanctification. You're now His. And you become a new creation in Christ. Because of His sovereign power. That's where regeneration, that word comes. Because you, you've entered into a, a divine life. In obedience to Christ. And you've become a new creation. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.16. We always love reading 17. But we always skip 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one by the flesh. Even though we have known Christ by the flesh... Yet we know Him in this way no longer. Like you may have known who Christ is in the flesh, but that doesn't make you a Christian. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things, have, uh, the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. God causes a new birth in that believer. It's a new life. If you question whether somebody's following God. If they're not growing and they're going back to the old life. You have your answer. We see this all the time in the church. There'll be people who will run up and give their life to Christ and say the prayer. Three weeks later, they're gone. 
But they think that that salvation is secure, but there's, they never became a new creation. There was never any growth. They're still living by the will of the flesh. The prayer doesn't save you. To be born again is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. It's something that God does. Through the Son, the work that was done on the cross, as Christ defeated death and sin and was resurrected, to be born again is God's work. The, you know what the greatest testimony that you can get? Is when somebody tells you, man, I knew that person. They were never like this. They're completely different. They would never go to church. They would never pray with you, talk with you. They don't, that's not the person. I love that when people tell me that because then that lets me know, okay, God's getting the glory and God's still working in me. Man, I remember how Mike was. It's not the, the Mike I used to know. Praise God. I don't want you to know that Mike anymore. See, when we are born again, James tells us it's a new birth as well. In James chapter 1, verse 18, and the exercise of his will, he gave us birth by the word of truth. Who is the, the word of truth? The Logos. And the word became flesh, Jesus Christ. So that we would be kind of his first fruits among his creatures. And then we'll look at this when we get to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Peter does it even one better. He says, since you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So maybe it's time for us to start asking people, are you born again? Again, not do you know Jesus. Okay? We need to get back to this term. I don't know why the church has gotten away from it. Are you born again? Well, what does that mean? You know, you go, did you get into it with them as far as what the gospel is? Because they say I, what, every person you go up to is going to know Jesus. Our second point is born into a living hope. It says, blessed, uh, blessed, be the God or, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. To a living hope. So we have this, this living hope that, uh, that sustains the believer. And I think this is one of the things that we have to remember it's like no matter what circumstance you have, you have a living hope. When you forget that you have a living hope, you fall into despair. And it causes problems with your, your faith. One of the things we know is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Constantly keeping in the mind your work of faith and labor of love and the perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the presence of of God and Father, we think about the faith, hope, and love. That's one of the the virtues that we have from First Corinthians thirteen. And faith always leads us to work. And love is an evidence. The agape love, a sacrifice, sacrificial love, is an evidence of our salvation. And then we become servants of Christ because we love Him. And then the third evidence that we have is the salvation is hope looking for the return of Jesus Christ. You should wake up with that hope every day. Today's the day. Am I ready? Am I ready for his return? He could come back today. Are you ready for that? And that's why a lot of people struggle in, at death. They struggle with their, their faith at the end because they lost some way, somehow they've forgotten their hope. A living hope. Like, you're, you have Christ. You have Christ. You have a living hope. 
It's important for us to, to remember that, not to lose. And there's so many scriptures that deal with hope. It's throughout the Bible. In 1 Timothy 6.17, it says, Instruct those who are rich in the present world not to be conceited or set their hope on uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore prepare your minds for action. I love that verse. Keep sober in the Spirit. Set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's like, prepare your mind for action. Every time you open the Word of God, prepare your mind for action. Every time you listen to the Word of God, prepare your mind for action. Because I'm talking to you. A lot of times we get into the Word of God and you go, man, that's really good for my wife. That's really good for my kids. No, he's talking to you. The person in the mirror is the biggest problem that you'll deal with every day. Remember that. If you can walk with Christ with faith, hope, and love, You'll change a marriage. You'll change a family. Well, that concludes today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to submit a prayer request or get in contact with us to find out service times, you can do all of that at our website, uh, as well as get uh, our podcast at Spotify, Audible, TuneIn Radio, pretty much wherever you can find a podcast. Uh, you, you can just type in Sun, Salt, and Light, and you'll find it. 